Um, Miss Williams, we've reflected overnight on the the overall timetable. We think it's probably best if you um, make your submissions on this point and then go straight on to your other submissions to which Mr Laddie can then respond and then any reply can be uh, at the very end. Thank you, my lord. We, we, we hope that that's convenient for everyone. Yes, that was also the basis on which we'd have further discussions overnight, my lord. There we are. I think that uh, works the best. So I was going to turn to ground two. Yes. Uh, obviously quite a um, portion of this I foreshadowed already, so I can be relatively brief. As you will recall, ground two, my learned friend's grounds, is that the Employment Appeal Tribunal was wrong to say that the Employment Tribunal had not found illegality post 1st July 2014. It is, we say of note, that the highest that my learned friend Mr Laddie is able to put his submissions in respect of this ground is that the Employment Tribunal made implicit findings or findings that can be inferred is another phrase that he used and we respectfully submit that is a very weak foundation upon which to base a ground which asserts as an error of law that the EAT was wrong to find that the Employment Tribunal in fact made no findings in relation to the um, July 2014 period when it must follow from Malona Friend's own uh, uh, reliance on implicit and inferred propositions that he accepts that there are no such express findings to be located anywhere in the judgment. And so that in our respectful submission is the significant starting point for ground two. In short, my lords, we say that the Employment Appeal Tribunal was quite correct to say that the Tribunal identified no post 1st July 2014 illegality. And you will recall yesterday that I took you to paragraph 98 through to 104 of the Employment Tribunal's decision. I'm happy to look back at it if it assists, but otherwise I'll rest on the propositions that I um, made yesterday. Uh, namely, that one finds no reference within those paragraphs to illegality on the part of the claimant post the 1st of July 2014. You'll remember that paragraph 99, which identifies the illegality, refers in terms to the first seven years, as to say 2007 to June 2014. And the only reference to matters after June 2014 comes in paragraphs 101 and 104 in the context of the submissions that the claimant made about the respondents' actions, and specifically in the context of paragraph 104 of the Employment Tribunal saying that in any event that didn't cure the claimant's illegality, which, as you appreciate, we say in itself was a misdirection. But furthermore, it's no indication that the uh, tribunal was identifying any illegality on the part of the claimant uh, post June <coughs> 2014. I think one strand of Mr. Laddie's submissions, and you may query whether this actually is one of the grounds of appeal, but leave that <coughs> procedural point to one side for the moment. But yesterday he submitted that, as a matter of law, there was a continuing breach continuing illegality because the taxpayer uh, commits a, an offence not just at the time but they continue to commit it which is one of the reasons why as I understand it the revenue are able to impose penalties and not just claim <coughs> the underlying tax and so I think one of the strands of the argument made at least to us I don't know whether it was made in this way to the EAT or indeed to the ET but it's certainly been made to us, that it is simply the case, as a matter of law, there was a continuing illegality. Now, speaking for myself only, I've been wondering whether one answer to that proposition may be 
that what you're looking for is illegality in the performance of the contract, not general illegality. So there may be a continuing criminal offence being committed. Well, the answer to that is criminal sanctions if the standard of proof is met, etc., cetera, etc. Cetera. Um, is, is, is that one way of looking at this? Thing? My lord, exactly so, if I may say so. I touched on this yesterday. We say that the contract was performed lawfully in the period 1st July 2014 to uh, termination in May 2017. <clears throat> it may well be the case that there were outstanding liabilities in relation to the earlier period, as your lordship notes. But that does not, it does not follow from that that the contract was being formed unlawfully in the latter period that I've referred to, indeed quite the converse, as I said yesterday. The claimant was performing her duty <coughs> under the contract, she was being paid net, the monies were being held for tax and national assurance that was to go to the revenue. So the performance was entirely lawful during that period. I'll come on to my loan offence fraud allegation in a minute, but putting that on one side for a moment, the contract was being performed entirely lawfully uh, during the uh, almost last three years uh, of its uh, continuation. My Lord, so that's that's the central. So contrast that with an example where, as in a different sort of uh, post, the employee had been required to maintain a certain professional status or insurance, perhaps, if that's a valid analogy. That would be an ongoing obligation. But the, here you say, facilities in respect of earlier periods do not amount to ongoing illegal performance of the contract. Indeed, my Lord, that's exactly. Had the claimant paid that money off, then that would be, a, as it were, a strong point in her favour in relation to the earlier periods. But the fact remains that in any event, those outstanding liabilities do not mean that the contract was performed unlawfully from 1st July 2014. So, my Lord, that's the central response. There's a further more specific response, but it is relevant. Just that, although my learned friend did repeatedly make this point yesterday, it's not to be found anywhere in the tribunal's reasoning. So he criticises the Employment Appeal Tribunal. It has to be remembered that the ground two is to say that the Employment Appeal Tribunal was wrong to say that ET didn't find illegality after the 1st of July 2014. But in fact, that ET says nothing on this point. It's simply a submission that my learned friend has developed before this court, and I think it's fair to say he did raise it before Mr Justice Lewis. I don't remember that. I must confess I don't remember all the details, but I, I, I'm not suggesting he didn't raise it at all. Uh, but it's certainly not something that the tribunal um, finds or addresses uh, and that is important within the framework of what ground two is alleging as the EAT's error. So that's the, as it were, the narrower response in addition to the, to the broader response uh, to Mr Laddie's point. And given those two points I probably don't need to take any technical points about it not being a ground of appeal but technically it's not something it isn't, it isn't uh, uh, expressed as such uh, as a ground of appeal. Uh, my lords, uh, consistent with these propositions, and as I say, I'll come on to deal with the broad point in, in, in a moment, we say that the long and short of the Employment Tribunal <coughs> reasoning, consistent with the misdirection that I, or misdirections that I identified yesterday, and I'll develop when I come on to the respondent's notice, the Employment Tribunal believed it was sufficient that they had found illegality in the period between 2007 and 2014. And they effectively stopped at that point. We found illegality in that period. That debars the claimant from claiming. I'm summarising, but that is, in our submission, an accurate uh, distillation of the tribunal's reasoning. As regards, then, Mr Laddie's uh, second point under this ground, the assertion that there was illegality between 2014 and 2017 because the claimant claimed that the contractual sum was a net payment rather than a gross payment, a proposition that was rejected by the tribunal, which on their findings was something that she knew all along. I should perhaps say for completeness that's not something my client accepts, but we accept it's a finding fact that's, that's unappealable, so that is the factual matrix um, we realistically accept before, before this court. A number of points to make in relation to that, my lords. Firstly, that is not the illegality found by the tribunal. As I highlighted for you yesterday, the references in beginning of paragraph 98 and beginning of paragraph 100, tribunals say full squarely that the illegality on page 
payment of taxes. I don't always be finding a fact and that is the finding that is made. Secondly, with all due respect, my learned friend struggled to identify for you anywhere in the decision, even implicitly, that the Employment Tribunal had made either a finding of fraud, as he would have it, or indeed anything equivalent to it. And I'm not going to take you back over the questions and answers on that point of yesterday. I'm sure you have them very much in mind. But the long and the short of it, we say, is that there is no such finding in the Employment Tribunal's judgment, but more particularly than there being no such finding where the Tribunal sets out their findings of fact, it is not an aspect that is identified by the Tribunal at all when they come on to consider illegality. And if my learned friend is right that, he, uh, that that was urged upon the Tribunal, my uh, learned junior, Mr Stevenson, remembers things slightly differently. But if it is right that it was urged upon the Tribunal, it's simply all the more noteworthy that the Employment Tribunal did not accept uh, plainly that submission. <coughs> We respectfully, uh, in this regard, rely too on paragraph 97 of the Employment Tribunal, Employment Appeal Tribunal's reasoning. I don't think we've looked at that yet yesterday, Mama, so if we could just look at that, which is where this point was dealt with. It's page 165 of the documents bundle. And it's paragraph 97. <coughs> I can just invite you to remind yourself of paragraph 97. In effect, Mr Justice Lewis makes two points there. The first is the point that I just made to you, Lordships, and the second, which is the point I come on to, is that the contract was being performed lawfully, for the reasons I've addressed your Lordships on during this period, and that in any event, making one or other party to the employment contract making an inaccurate, even a knowingly inaccurate, assertion to the other does not, in our submission, amount to unlawful performance of the contract. It's a, there was a dispute going on. It is in our submission striking that in all the authorities on illegality in the employment context going back over a lengthy period of time, or indeed in that matter in other contractual contexts, there is no authority that my learning friend can point to that suggests making a knowingly inaccurate assertion in relation to some aspect of the contract or other during the course of a discussion or negotiation with the other party itself amounts to illegality. <coughs> Here it was a point that was made in a number of items of correspondence. It doesn't even go so far, for example, as someone who brings a, a knowingly inaccurate legal claim or threatens one with a letter before claim. It was simply assertions made in a series of letters uh, in, in, in correspondence. And the idea that that can amount to contractual <coughs> illegality in, emphasise, the performance of the contract uh, is, in our submission, simply inaccurate. So uh, a, a, a false claim for expenses, an exaggerated claim for expenses, which might lead to dismissal, that exaggerated uh, claim would not by itself amount to illegal performance of the contract? Indeed, my lord. And equally looking at it, as it were, from the other end of the telescope, if an employer were to make false allegations through one of, or other of its managers about an employee's performance or some other aspect uh, of their conduct, uh, then that would not amount to illegality. If, if, if my learned friend is right, the consequences would be extremely far-reaching. 
in terms of the expansion of uh, the illegality <coughs> that is entirely commonplace, uh, quite frankly, up and down the country, that there will be parties to an employment contract disputing what the other one is saying and claiming that the other party knows full well that what they are saying is untrue. Uh, it is, um, quite frankly, jaw-dropping to suggest that that amounts to illegality uh, when that is never uh, a, a proposition to be found, or in, as far as I can see, even suggested in any of the authorities. And in our submission, Mr Justice Lewis was entirely correct to reject it. Legality, leaving aside immorality kind of legality, because it doesn't figure in this sort of situation, legality is found in the breach of whether it be a statutory requirement, a regulatory requirement, a taxation obligation, or something of that nature. It isn't simply to be found uh, in saying something which the other party disputes and believes to be untrue. Uh, and so, my lord, that is the uh, short answer to the second element of my learned friends, round two. Drawing those two threads together, the continued non-payment of the liabilities from 2007 to 2014, and this point about the gross net assertion. My learned, learned friend goes so far as to say, both in his skeleton and in his oral submissions to you yesterday, that the tribunal found that the claimant's <coughs> illegality actually worsened in 2014. And that proposition is simply absurd. There's absolutely nothing in the tribunal's decision that supports the proposition, the proposition that it found that illegality worsened. 2014 into the country for the reasons that I've indicated. It found no, no illegality. I'm not sure Mr. Laddie either. did say the tribunal found that it worsened. I think it was a passing observation of Mr. Laddie's that on one view it had worsened. But I, maybe I've <coughs> misremembered Ms. Williams. My Lord, I think he says it in paragraph 44 of the skeleton, but in any event, it's a bad point if I may say so. Well, either way, it's a bad point. Um, uh, well, well, perhaps just before we move on, um, certainly I. I'd understood Mr. Laddie's point <clears throat> to be not that the tribunal made a specific finding on a specific point, but that the effect of the findings the tribunal did make was that the picture after 2014 was worse than, than it had been before. Um, <clears throat> so perhaps we'd better just um, be clear what you say about that. Do, do you say um, the picture was <clears throat> in any respect the same, or is, is your submission that the picture was just completely transformed for the better after 2014? My Lord, the latter. We say that the Employment Appeal Tribunal was right to treat 1st July 2014 as a watershed moment, because there was no illegality after that time in the performance of the contract. And the only two strands that my learned friend relies on to say that there was is one, the outstanding liabilities from the earlier period. I've dealt with that point. <coughs> and secondly, is the, uh, on the tribunal's findings, false assertion that the uh, claimant understood that she was being paid net rather than gross. And I've dealt with that point. There, there is no other aspect to my learned friend's contention that there was illegality after 1st July 2014. And does it, does it make any difference to your um, watershed submission? that what happened was um, action on the part of the respondent um, and, and no action on the part of the claimant? My Lord, no, because the effect uh, was still the same. The claimant was being paid net, she was performing her duties, and the money ultimately was going to the revenue for tax and national insurance. So how that process came to be initiated for these purposes is neither here nor there. I mean, uh, is it relevant in that context that they actually found later on that it would otherwise have been an unlawful deduction? Uh, they didn't allow the claim to succeed for a deduction of wages, but simply going back to the point about illegality. But actually, as I read it, and you showed us this paragraph yesterday, yes. when addressing her claim for unlawful deduction of wages, they actually said the employer had no power to be keeping they could report it to HMRC, there may have been other <coughs> ways in which to address the problem, but the, the solution they chose, it's all a bit murky. I say that one party 
is performing her contract illegally, well, actually the other party has unlawfully deducted wages, arguably. It's a bit, it's a bit odd. Uh, my Lord, I respectfully and entirely agree. I was simply focusing on the, for the purposes of answering the question, on the, whether the claimant had acted I unlawfully. Mm. But I agree that's a relevant factor as well, certainly if, if and when one comes onto the proportionality analysis. Mm. Uh, I, I should, of course, I didn't perhaps make this point explicitly, although I think I touched on it yesterday. But let's, he said that there is a reference in paragraph 99 of the tribunal's judgment to the. Um, earlier findings of fact about net gross. That appears purely in the context of explaining why the tribunal found there was illegality in the period 2007 to 2014, a point that, as you heard yesterday, was an issue before the tribunal. It cannot sensibly be read as the tribunal saying, well, this was a further element of illegality by performance. Was I then turn to ground three, the contention that the Employment Appeal Tribunal was wrong to conclude that there was no reasonable basis upon which the Employment Tribunal could find that the claimant performed the contract unlawfully uh, after uh, the 1st of July uh, 2014. The reasoning of Mr Justice Lewis in, in, in this regard is in paragraph 98. We looked at paragraph 98 yesterday in the context of ground one. If, my Lord, if we could just briefly look back at paragraph 98, which is to be found at page 165. <coughs> And there are essentially two stages to Mr Justice Lewis's reasoning. I may I'll start with the latter stage and work backwards. So if one picks it up on page 166 at line 6, the sentence that starts on the facts. On the facts, there could be no such illegality after the 1st of July 2014. Uh, and if you'll read on, you'll see that Mr Justice Lewis recaps the points he made in paragraph 97 in that regard as to why there was no illegal performance <coughs> after that date. And he concludes that paragraph by saying, in those circumstances, there's no basis for concluding there was illegality in the performance of the contract after the 1st of July 2014, which would justify refusing the claimant, refusing to allow the claimant to enforce the contract and the statutory rights arising out of it. So no legality in performance post 1st July 2014. And then the former state <coughs> his reasoning, which we saw at the top of the page, uh, relates to the earlier period, mm -hmm. where he says, line 1, 2, 4, there is no reasonable basis upon which an employment tribunal could conclude that it was required as a matter of public public policy in May 2017 refused to allow the claimant to enforce the contract of employment and rights arising out of it because of the events that had occurred before 1st July 2014. There are those two stages to his reasoning. The reason I took you to the latter period first is because that's the period that I've just addressed in relation to ground two. And if your lordships are with me in relation to ground two, it also shows that he is completely right here in his reasoning uh, 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 in the... <coughs> passage that gives rise to ground three, <coughs> as far as it relates to post the 1st of July 2014. One doesn't want to be unduly technical for the sake, sake of it, uh, but it is right to say that Maloney Friend's ground of appeal only relates to Mr Justice Lewis's conclusion in respect of that latter period after 1st July 2014. If you look at back, my lords, at the actual grounds of appeal, which is on page 13 of the bundle. The EAT was wrong to conclude there was no reasonable basis upon which the ET could conclude that R illegally performed the contract after 1st July 2014. Yeah. So, 
in effect, and this is also what Malone first says in his skeleton, ground three is very closely allied to ground two, uh, and you have our submissions in relation to that. However, lest it be said that in effect, and I think this is the way that Malone Fran was addressing it yesterday, lest it be said that it is intended that ground three is in fact a broader attack on paragraph 98, and if your lordships are minded to permit the expansion of ground three in that way, albeit we note that's not how ground three was formulated, then we say in any event, Mr Justice Lewis's conclusion in relation to that earlier period, in those first four lines on page 166, is an entirely legitimate evaluation. He was in a position to make and which discloses no error of law. That, that, that's the, I'm afraid, speaking for myself, that's the bit I'm at the moment having difficulty following that reasoning. Because if one just stopped at the, at the fourth line on page 166 and analyse that proposition, there is no reasonable, no reasonable basis. It's a strong assertion <coughs> because suppose the dismissal had occurred in 2014 shortly after the respondent discovers that the claimant has not been paying her tax for the last seven years. What would your submission be then? My submission would plainly be a considerably more difficult one uh, uh, to make, uh, my lord. But the reality is that we are nearly three years later, uh, during a period in which the contract was performed lawfully, and <coughs> as I said yesterday, a period longer than that which the claimant would need in order to establish continuity, in order to establish the right to claim unfair dismissal, which is a significant and point. I see that. I do, sorry, I don't want to interrupt your answer at all. I, I, I do see that. But I'm just wondering whether it's really possible for an appellate to try you know, to say there is no reasonable basis. The only one answer was available rationally to the first instance tribunal, as opposed to saying, look, they, they never considered any of this. They didn't actually give thought to the balancing proportionality question and so on, so I should admit it, let them decide, see what they come up with. Well, my Lord, if I may say so, I understand the point entirely. Um, and obviously, if that point were <coughs> correct, uh, if you were with us in relation to ground one and two, most it would have... It, it, uh, uh, and potentially with a simulation to the response notice as well, but that's not essential. So, uh, that the correct course would be to remit. My learned friend is certainly, um, we would respectfully say, over ambitious in suggesting that this court could substitute a finding of no illegality. And I'll come on to that in a moment, if I may. Uh, but the logical conclusion from the point that my Lord Lord Singh makes to me is that if that is the only respect in which Mr. Justice Lewis erred, and he was correct in identifying the errors made by the tribunal, as I began my submissions to you yesterday with, <coughs> then it must be right. Uh, he was right to set aside the tribunal's order in respect of illegality, but the consequence would be that the claim is remitted to the tribunal in, in, in respect of that issue. So well, that appears to us to be the consequence, thinking through that line of thought. I appreciate that there is that it's a point fairly briefly expressed. Obviously, it has to be read in the context of the earlier reasoning, and clearly the learned judge was particularly mindful when one takes his reasoning as a whole that uh, there had been this substantial period of lawful performance post those earlier events. Uh, and whilst he didn't call it proportionality, plainly he was weighing up all the factors I will, when I come on to the respondent's notice in Patel and Merza, I will address you on proportionality here. And we respectfully submit it is a case where the factors point strongly uh, in the claimant's favour. I, I think um, <coughs> yesterday morning, I think Mr Laddie was prepared to accept that it might be <coughs> open to a tribunal to say, well, the past illegality doesn't justify dismissal now without needing to identify a point in time up to which it would have justified dismissal and after which it, it didn't. Um, <clears throat> and 
and so speaking for myself, I wonder in line two on page uh, 166 whether the, the in <coughs> inclusion of the words in May 2017 may or may not be significant. Well, my Lord, I, I, I agree entirely, uh, but if I'm associated for that reason, and also the inclusion of the words as a matter of public mm. policy, because that phrase we would respectfully suggest is a shorthand for, in effect, saying, I've taken into account, I've balanced out all the considerations pointing one way and the other that the parties urged on me in their respective submissions. Uh, and this is where I've concluded the balance falls. So, my Lord, I would respectfully agree, but with that, um, addition to both those two phrases are highly significant. So r r running, <coughs> running the <coughs> all the words together. Then do, is, is your submission this that um, it, it's not simply a temporal point. It <coughs> it could be read as meaning in all the circumstances which confronted the tribunal as at May twenty seventeen. Uh, indeed, my lord. And plainly, I suggest as Lewis was fully aware of the um, two thousand and seventeen to two thousand and fourteen period which he dealt with. Um, just a few paragraphs before, it can't be said this is a situation where the judge has overlooked or, or not appreciated the nature of the illegal illegality during that period. He plainly was um, fully mindful of that. Yes, thank you. I'm so, sorry to have interrupted you. No, not, not, not at all, my lord. I, I do need to deal briefly with my learned friend's, as it were, counter assertion that uh, if uh, this court considers that there is merit in his ground three, or if I've understood his submissions correctly, he says this in relation to his, his other grounds as well, then this court should simply um, substitute a finding of illegality, or restore the employment tribunal's finding to, to, to that effect. We respectfully submit that that would not be the correct course, uh, as the court will be aware. It's not for the appellate court to make findings of fact, and the court must remit, unless despite any identified error of law, the question only admits of one answer. And I don't think I need to take you through it because it's trite law, but the Jaffrey and Lincoln College um, authority is in the bundle, page 250, which sets out those principles. If my learned friend is right, and this would be the only context in which it arises, so the court would have had to have found some merit in one or other of his propositions. But if my learned friend is right, uh, then his submissions rest <coughs> on a number of matters that simply haven't been found by the tribunal at this stage. Specifically, the two strands of his alleged illegality post June 2014 that I've been addressing you on. Currently, no findings by the tribunal in relation to either of those matters. Currently, no findings by the tribunal as to the respondent's degree of responsibility because we say the tribunal wrongly believed it didn't have to make any such findings because it <coughs> misdirected itself that in any event the respondent's actions couldn't cure the claimant's illegality. And indeed, my learned friend's submissions are replete with a number of other underlying propositions that do not find expressions in the tribunal's findings of fact, for example, that his client's motivation was uh, to act benignly and give the claimant plenty of time to sort out her affairs and so on. So, uh, my lords, it seems to us that the only way in which you could find for Mr Laddie would involve this court accepting that there was merit or potential merit in at least one or more of his propositions, but they would be propositions that did not rest or did not fully rest on findings already made by the Employment Tribunal. Uh, and therefore, uh, in our submission, whatever else the various permutations this court uh, um, could do, it would be wholly inappropriate uh, if the court finds that there was any error in the approach of Mr Justice Lewis, it would be wholly inappropriate to simply restore the finding of illegality below. And of course, if we are right in our central respondent's notice point, then that reinforces uh, this submission. My Lord, I'm sorry. I'm sorry to leave <coughs> an earlier 
point, but, but um, I, I'm afraid I'm still troubled, speaking for myself, by the first quarter of page 166 uh, between A and B. Yesterday, when we were looking at ground one, we heard your submissions about the significance, if any, of that sentence which begins, the respondent would have to identify, and so on. And I understand your submissions about ground one, and, 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 and it may or may not be right, but let, let's assume that there's a complete answer to ground one, yes. so, that it, so that that sentence doesn't demonstrate an error of law in relation to ground one. But the question I am still troubled by is whether it does demonstrate an error of law in underground three because the, the structure of the reasoning as a matter of logic appears to be this. In the first sentence, the judge says, there is no reasonable basis on which the ET could conclude because of events before July 2014. And yesterday, uh, there was an exchange with the bench, which, which, which I think, uh, led to the submission from you that we then have to read the next sentence in the context of the first sentence so that one reads in words as it were along the lines of before the ET could reasonably conclude to that effect in the circumstances of this case the respondent would have to identify the way in which the claimant knowingly participated in the illegal performance of the contract after 1 July 2014 and it's that that leap of logic, which at the moment I'm afraid I'm just not following. Why is that? Why is any illegal performance of the contract after July 2014 of any relevance to the question whether you could reasonably conclude that events before that date l justify uh, allowing illegality to be a defence to the claim for unfair dismissal? Because, as you said to me a moment ago, if the dismissal had occurred in 2014, it would be very difficult to argue that illegality is not a defence. Well, my lord, we respectfully submit that the key, um, or one of the key uh, points, as my lord, Lord Justice Holroyd um, um, referenced uh, in his question to me, is that the first um, full sentence on that page makes clear that the judge is saying um, he's asking himself the position <coughs> looking at the matter in May 2017. No, I understand that. But, but, but uh, speaking for myself, I'm having difficulty with the proposition that the sustained illegality before 2014 could not reasonably <coughs> lead to a conclusion in May 2017. The, that sentence has to be read Sir, I'm only repeating myself. And it has I, to be read in the And I don't want you to repeat yourself. The, 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 the critical part of the reasoning that the judge deploys, which I'm having real difficulty with, I must confess at the moment, is the logical link he makes between illegal performance after July 2014. Because he, he says, that's, that's in the second sentence, he says, that's what the respondent would have to identify. And, and I just, that, and that may be right, but I, I'm having difficulty in accepting that it's right as a matter of logic, because it may be that for all sorts of reasons, by the time you get to May 2017, the earlier illegality is no longer sufficient. I can see that argument, well see that argument, and that, if I may say so, is really the point that my Lord was putting to you a moment ago. But that's not the point the judge is making here. The judge seems to be saying that before that argument could succeed, the respondent would have to identify further illegality after July 2014. My Lord, but he's saying, he's saying that because he's arrived at the conclusion that in May 2017, that earlier illegality would not be sufficient. That's not enough, so therefore I turn to look to see what whether there's any illegality 1st of July 2014 onwards. No, there isn't. All right, thank you. Uh, my Lord, turning then to ground four, that the Employment Appeal Tribunal was wrong to uh, sever the uh, post 1st of July 2014 period. The relevant paragraph there of Mr Justice Lewis's judgment is paragraph 99. <coughs> I'm not sure if you were taken directly to that yesterday. I'm in your house whether it's 
helpful for the court to, to remind um, themselves of paragraph 29. Yes, thank you. We'll, we'll just read that. Friends, ground four is not well founded and is dismissed by this court, then that in itself provides an alternative basis for upholding the course that the EA took, EAT took. Uh, in other words, not only <coughs> identifying errors below, uh, but in uh, substituting the finding of un, um, unfair and wrongful dismissal that it did. My Lord, the second point make is that Malone Friends contentions, I'll just give you the cross reference, uh, paragraphs 54 and 55 of his skeleton are entirely predicated on the proposition which he raised under ground two, namely that the EAT was wrong to conclude no unlawful performance post 1st of July 2014 he does not contend that blue chip was wrongly decided or that severance is not a principle that survives Mercer. and that would be I don't want to be unduly technical but that would be a very wide sweeping uh, extension of his ground of appeal uh, uh, and in our respectful submission he should be um, held to his ground of appeal we respectfully submit that there is no error of law in Mr Justice Lewis's reasoning in paragraph 99 and he was entitled given the 1st July 2014 watershed that I've referred to, he was entitled to regard the events after that as sufficiently separable from the earlier period. Uh, my Lord, in relation to blue chip itself, I ask you to just turn that back briefly. It's page 165 in the authorities bundle. Firstly, I believe my learned friend took you to this passage yesterday, but if I can just remind you, in relation to paragraphs 37 and 38 on page 178, where the learned judge drew a distinction between performance during the period of time when the visa limitation applied in para 36 periods of time, holidays and so forth, when it didn't, that he plainly was considering matters from the perspective of public policy. One sees that in the opening sentence of paragraph 38. And that is in our submission relevant insofar as doubts may have been planted yesterday as to whether blue chip survives Patella Mirza. Undoubtedly, Patella Mirza has very helpfully uh, elucidated and illuminated the public policy considerations that a court is to have regard to but Mr Justice Elias's approach as he then was is not inconsistent with that he is looking at public policy considerations he's not simply applying some kind of rigid bright line test and there is we respectfully submit an element of Maloney Friends submission seeking to have their cake and eat it in as much as he relies on Arcadena to say that the pre Patel and Merzer authorities still apply, it's still good law, but this blue chip is one of the cases that was cited uh, by Mr Justice Underhill in um, <coughs> Ocadena, uh, uh, and so that proposition on the face of it holds good <coughs> in relation to that as well. <coughs> a learned friend says that unfair dismissal is a unitary claim, 
we submit it is capable of severance. Specifically, you already have the point about the continuity of employment. Uh, and secondly, it is quite possible to sever, in effect, the compensation that would be awarded so that it only reflects the years where there was no illegality. Mr Justice Lewis, in this case, has power of give you the reference. Um, in his uh, decision, it is uh, paragraph uh, 101, 102. Uh, he said specifically in 102, when referring to the basic award in relation to unfair dismissal, that consistent with the approach of severance that he had identified, the claim is compensation for unfair dismissal under the basic award, which your Lordships will appreciate is calculated by reference to the number of whole years of employment <coughs> that should only reflect those later years. Now, it will doubtless be said that uh, that, uh, that we uh, raised a subsidiary point in our respondent's notice, and it's paragraph 66 of our skeleton, um, raising a criticism of that approach, in as much as on the face of it remedies wasn't before. Uh, the EAT hadn't yet been addressed by the uh, in, in Employment uh, 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 Tribunal, let alone the Employment Appeal Tribunal. Uh, and that is why we raised an issue in relation to that. But I don't intend to develop the point any further than that. And, and if, in fact, Mr Justice Lewis is right uh, in that respect, it shows entirely how uh, the unfair dismissal uh, claim was capable of severance. Well, the fourth and last point I make about blue chip, uh, and one sees this, for example, from paragraph 32 and 33, is that there is no doubt that in relation to the <coughs> breaching of the visa conditions, this was, as Mr Justice Lewis, I'm sorry, Mr Justice Elias said, a flagrant and deliberate breach. That in itself did not preclude uh, severance. No doubt intentionality was a factor taken into account. It didn't preclude uh, severance. Again, um, using the case to posit an, a, a negative, but no suggestion in this case of any kind of concept of purging of contempt, of accepting um, uh, uh, one's wrongness in the past and seeking to put it right. It's simply not a concept one finds in the illegality authorities. And the correct question, as one sees from the bottom of paragraph 35, the crucial issue is whether it is possible to separate the legal from the illegal. And that is precisely the question that Mr Justice Lewis asked, uh, and we respectfully submit no error of law. What do you say to Mr Laddie's submission <coughs> that uh, if, if the law takes that course, it would tend to encourage the employer to dismiss sooner rather than later? Because by trying to be helpful, they prejudice their own position because they can't dismiss later. My Lords, um, I think touched on this yesterday. We say that if it is the case that an employer acts benignly, that would be a factor that is relevant in the public policy proportionality analysis. Uh, and therefore, if an employer acts in that spirit uh, and is able to demonstrate that, then uh, that is a matter that is properly taken into account. No, 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 I appreciate that. I, I, I'm not sure that quite meets the burden of the submission. I, I think the submission is that as a matter of legal principle, what it, if this court were to say that is the law, that would in other cases in the future tend <coughs> to encourage employers to dismiss sooner rather than later, rather than be benign, and wait for that overall balancing to be done. Well, we would respectfully submit that is um, uh, largely a matter of speculation. Yes, I see. Here you are dealing with hard facts of a particular case and particular proportionality considerations to apply. Uh, my Lord, I'm conscious of the time. I'm then going to turn to the respondents' notice, the Patel and Mirza point. Uh, <coughs> the, if I can start by summarising the respondents' position, which I touched on yesterday. We say that there is an additional reason why the EAT was correct to set aside tribunal's findings in relation to illegality 
and it is that the tribunal erred in failing to apply the Patel and Mercer trio of necessary considerations and in particular in failing to consider whether denial of the wrongful dismissal and unfair dismissal claims on grounds of illegality was a proportionate response in all the circumstances to the identified illegality. And you will appreciate, as I submitted yesterday, that it is that approach which applies the, the something more factor beyond active participation that my learned friend accepts. Even the pre Patel Mirza authorities identified as necessary, but pre Patel and Mirza there was uncertainty as to how that was approached. My lords, we also submit that the requirement to consider proportionality is either di derived directly <coughs> from Patel and Mercer, which is binding on this court, or if my learned friend is right that the judgment of this court in Ocadina compels the conclusion that the earlier whole line of authorities already factored in proportionality. But in fact, it matters not for the purposes of this submission because either way, the Employment Tribunal was required to apply it. And it is perfectly clear from the passages that I took you to yesterday, specifically paragraphs 94, 96, 97, and 98, that they didn't. <coughs> so the error is made out by either route. It may be that it is possible to apply a hybrid of the two approaches, namely to accept that the whole line of authorities is still good law, but that Patel and Mirza, uh, we'd respectfully sub submit, elucidates what that something more is, what is required in addition to active participation, namely that it must be proportionate to bar the claim on grounds of illegality. And it may be if one approaches it in that way, then the cases can sit harmoniously together. There is in our submission certainly nothing mechanistic about applying Patel and Mirza, my learned friend suggested yesterday. It is a substantive, fact-sensitive, important proportionality analysis that we say should be applied in each case. <coughs> my lords, I foreshadowed yesterday that I would take you briefly to the uh, Quashi case in the EAT, because you'll remember that's the one that the tribunal refers to in paragraph 97 and 98 and seems to pay particular regard to when directing itself as to the law. Uh, my Lord, that is to be found at page 230 onwards in the bundle. To summarise the facts very briefly, Ms Quaji was a lap dancer at Stringfellows and she claimed to be an employee and brought an unfair dismissal claim. The tribunal below said she wasn't an employee, so that was the end of the matter. And therefore dealt with an alternative defence of illegality very briefly. The Employment Appeal Tribunal, who's on the Judge uh, McMullen Queen's Council, held that the tribunal below had erred in finding that she wasn't an employee, and remitted the case on that basis. But because the employee issue was now in play again, it went on to consider illegality. But simply to complete the story of the case, in fact, in due course, a further appeal to the Court of Appeal uh, uh, reinstated the tribunal's conclusion that Ms Quashie was not an employee and therefore didn't consider illegality at all. That's why we haven't included the Court of Appeal's report. Uh, the consideration of illegality, uh, my lords, is to be found page 239 onwards. It's paragraphs in total 65 to 85, but I'm just going to take you to the heart of it. In the first few paragraphs, the learned judge sets out the employment judge's reasoning below, and essentially he goes on to find that she didn't deal with illegality sufficiently. 
you will see from paragraph 69 and 70 that the respondent Stringfellows argued both that the contract was illegal per se and also sees line 3 in paragraph 70 its primary argument was that it was illegally performed and if you need further details about the alleged illegality they are to be found in paragraph 83 essentially the claimant it was said was misrepresenting her level of earnings and expenses to the revenue you will see there's a heading above paragraph 72 the legal principles and the Part of the decision is in paragraphs 78 and 79, if I could ask your Lordships to read those two paragraphs, please. And there's a reference back therein to the McConnell case, which you'll see at paragraph 74. say whether or not that was a correct statement of the law at the time when this case was decided, it certainly isn't a correct statement of the law now or when the tribunal below in this case uh, had to deal with matters. Specifically, paragraph 79, the first two lines, sorry, first four lines, applying the above principles, the contract is performed illegally if the claimant knowingly makes false returns to HMRC on a scale above what might be described as minor faults, as in McConnell. And that's it, end of, on that approach. And that's clearly what sees, not only does the car tribunal cite, well actually, but that is precisely the approach which it, which it applies. And that is in our submission plainly an error of law. Uh, for your Lordship's reference, the um, indented citation from this decision which appears in paragraph 97 of the tribunal's judgment is to be found in line 4 onwards in paragraph 78. Oh, I took that paragraph as well. Is that the bit about um, why should she have access to the administration yes, of justice? Yes, the sentence that starts the claimant who seeks the protection. My Lord's turning then to Patel and uh, Mirza uh, itself. Uh, obviously, my Lord friend is taking me to the uh, central reasoning, if I can make a, a few points in relation uh, to uh, the case. Uh, firstly, uh, it is clear that, amongst other matters, the Supreme Court did consider specifically the contractual illegality and performance authorities and express some concerns in relation to them. And one sees that, I would respectfully suggest, from paragraph 3, first of all, you'll see a reference there to the, this is page 288, take the law of contract. And if you read the rest of paragraph 3, you'll see it's talking about illegality and performance. And the paragraph concludes by noting that the application of that doctrine has caused a good deal of uncertainty, complexity, and sometimes inconsistency. Uh, my Lord, and I think if I may just try and take it as shortly as I can, but to give you the, the references, 
The court then went on to note at the end of paragraph four, so on the next page, uh, the Law Commission's uh, uh, consultation paper from 1999, which was about the effects of illegality on contracts and trusts, and the conclusion that the case law lacks clear guidance on what amounts to participation in this context. There's then a reference in paragraph six as to um, it being open to doubt as to what is the basis of the principle of illegality in performance, a specific reference is made to Lord Justice Mance's judgment in Hall. And then to complete, as it were, this theme in the uh, judgment of Lord uh, Toulson, you will see at paragraph 21 onwards, this is page 293, he returns to the Law Commission paper in more detail, referring as well, you'll see at the bottom of that page, to a later paper, 2009 public consultation on the illegality uh, defence, and then if you turn to the top of the next page, 2010, uh, report following that consultation. And you'll see the Law Commission's conclusion is summarised at paragraph 23 onwards. The conclusion that the illegality defence presents serious problems represented the overwhelming view of academic commentators and consultees generally. And again, there's reference to complexity, uncertainty, arbitrariness, and lack of transparency. Uh, the paragraphs that follow then deal specifically with the Tinsley and Milligan point that was before the court on that occasion, but we needn't um, address in detail. Uh, my Lords, in terms of the structure of the judgment, then from paragraph 67 to 81, having looked at some comparative law, Lord Tulson considers some recent appellate cases, and there's just a couple of points, if I may, to draw your attention to within that traversing of the recent case law. Firstly, you'll see at 67 a reference to Parking Eye, the case we looked at yesterday. And then you will see at page 307 a reference to the Supreme Court decision in Wenger and Allen. And my Lord, the reason why I refer to that case was mindful of the question asked by my Lord, Lord Justice Singh, yesterday. This was a case, as you'll see from the bottom of the page, 75, a statutory tort discrimination uh, uh, case. And uh, you will see there was some discussion by the Supreme Court in that case as to the public policy considerations in a, in a tort <coughs> case. And specifically, if you look over the page at page 76, there is reference to Lord Wilson's judgment in that case. He did not consider the solution lay either in asking whether Miss Allen needed to rely on an illegal contract or in asking whether there was an inextricable link between illegality to which she was a party in her claim. Uh, uh, and then there's a citation from his paragraph 42 of his judgment, and the essence is the last few lines. Necessary first to ask what is the aspect of public policy which founds the defence, Second to ask, but is there another aspect of public policy to which the application of the defence would run counter? And one sees that those that approach then becomes reflected in the first two of the trio of necessary considerations. So, my lord, it's not directly germane to this appeal, but in light of your question asked yesterday, I thought it might be helpful to, 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 to see that. Yes, thank you. Uh, and, my lord, the third point to note, paragraph 80 and 81, there is reference to the Court of Appeal and the Supreme Court's subsequent decision in the Le Laboratoire case, which uh, you recall my Lord Lord Justice Singh drew, drew my attention to the reference to that in Parking Eye. And essentially there was a sharp division between the various judges who heard that case at the Court of Appeal and Supreme Court level with the Lord Tilson view now prevailing. Uh, so my Lord, it may also be relevant to be aware of that. And the next part of the judgment looks at the law at a crossroads. There's the reference to Professor Burroughs. Uh, in that context as well, it may be relevant to see at paragraph 85. This was Professor Burroughs' formulation of the current rules and then his critique of them. And you'll see his rule two is essentially the, um, as it then stood, the contractual performance, illegal performance. 
and he then critiques it from 87 through to 92. You may remember from the passage from Learning Friend took you to yesterday that Lord Tulsi didn't 100% align with all of Professor Burke's <laughs> um, analysis, but he certainly found it, he claimed he found it a very helpful uh, analysis which he referred to in detail. So, my Lord, I take you to that as well because it is relevant to understand in terms of seeing where we are now with the contractual illegality cases to understand how Lord Tulson viewed them in his judgments in Patel and Mirza. And we then come on to the passage which I won't go back to which you saw yesterday, the, the, the key passages of the judgment from 99 onwards. So if I should perhaps make the rather obvious point in relation to paragraph 107 in light of my learned friend's submissions in relation to that, that plainly it wasn't an exhaustive list of factors and it would be counter to the whole notion of proportionality to have a fixed and limited uh, list of factors that the court uh, took into account. Uh, my Lord, the other material that I just briefly draw your attention to, there is in the bundle an article from uh, or by Professors Green and Bog of Bristol University about the impact of Patel and Mirza uh, on the employment authorities on illegal contracts. It is respectfully an illuminating re read, but I, I take you to it to one point in particular which chimes with our submissions and with questions that were raised yesterday, and that is to be found the, the article head front piece of the article is page 543 of your bundle. It is only the section that considers illegality and contractual performance that we have included. But within that, if you look at page 547, top paragraph, <coughs> line 7, viewed through the lens of Patel, all cannot be viewed as a sufficient test for contractual illegality. This would be undesirable because knowledge and active participation do not allow the courts to examine matters of degree, such as the seriousness of illegality, relative culpability, and the proximity of the illegality to the legal claim. However, once it is established the employee is an accessory to the employer's illegality using the whole test, the trio may then be applied. So, my lord, there is an echo there in the questions and discussions that we have had thus far that active participation is a necessary but not a sufficient um, uh, criteria uh, uh, and that one then goes on to consider proportionality. Uh, I don't want to spend a lot of time on Ocadena because as I've already submitted we say um, either way whether the previous employment law cases allow for a proportionality analysis or whether one now derives that directly from Talon Mirza, in any event it's plain that the employment tribunal didn't apply it in this case. Uh, you have our submissions, my lords, about paragraph 62 of Lord Justice Underhill's uh, judgment in our, in our skeleton, if I can just go back to it very uh, briefly. So Ocadena is page 374 of the bundle. It is also right, says my learned friend fairly acknowledged yesterday, it's essentially a case, largely a case, I should say, about statutory legality. Paragraph 59 onwards, which is page 382. As we have observed, the crucial point in this case was there was a factual finding which is set out in the indented text in paragraph 59 that the claimant simply didn't know about the illegality. And so on the face of it, it was a very straightforward case in terms of common law illegality. Once the tribunal had made that finding a fact, there was no way that the illegality defence was going to succeed. 
no doubt that's why the bulk of the appeal before this court rested on the statutory illegality argument. The context in which the point was then being raised, as one sees from paragraph 60 to 61, was a complaint uh, that Her Honour Judge Edie, as she then was, had dealt with a submission that Teller Mirza, um, with each of the trio of necessary conditions um, uh, not being applied, that she dealt with that too um, briefly, too summarily. And you'll see at the start of 62, Miss Prince submitted that, and the that is um, Judge Edie's um, reasoning in the previous paragraph, that was an inadequate answer to uh, the, the Teller Mirza point. So you see it's in that context that Mr Reid counsel in that case submitted that it had not been necessary for the tribunal on the facts of that case to carry out an elaborate analysis by reference to the particular factors enumerated, uh, though if they had done so it would have been the same. And Lord Justice Underhill says, I agree on both points. You know, on, on a narrow reading, that essentially is the ratio of the case. Finding below, the claimant didn't know of the illegality. End of story no need on those facts to carry out a telemercer type analysis because there simply is no involvement in the claimant in the illegality you don't get to the active participation threshold i do appreciate and that's why i put our submissions in the alternative way as well that at least on one reading it can be said that the remainder of paragraph 62 is also part of the ratio of the case where lord justice underhill makes two additional points firstly that Patel and Mirza only involves a reconsideration of existing case law where such an application is inconsistent with its principles. Plainly, that must be right. And that was the point which the Supreme Court agreed with in the Henderson case. But then it's the third point, which one sees in the last three lines of page 382. In the case of a contract of employment which has been illegally performed, there's nothing in Patel and Mirza inconsistent with the well-established approach in Hall as regards third category cases. That, with the greatest respect to Lord Justice Underhill, I'm fully conscious of his very considerable experience in the employment law field, uh, but on the face of it and seeing how critical, in fact, Lord Toulson was about the contractual performance test and the whole line of cases, it's perhaps a little hard to reconcile with Lord Toulson's uh, judgment. And it may be, it seems, when one looks back as well at the opening paragraphs of this case, um, uh, uh, that the uh, submissions before the court were very focused uh, on the statutory uh, illegality point. <coughs> but as I say, be that as it may, if Lord Justice Underhill was correct in saying the proportionality principles are already reflected in the whole line of cases, well, well, so be it. It still follows that the Employment Tribunal erred in the present case in not applying that. Do you want to say how you would contend, if you do contend, that the that Patel and Mozart is inconsistent with the well-established approach? Well, how, would you, how would you summarise that? Yes, my lord. Uh, on one reading of or, uh, the whole line of authorities, it is unclear that there is a requirement to consider whether it would be proportional to apply the illegality defence once active participation is established. There is uncertainty. Perhaps I can put it more clearly. I'll, <laughs> I'll have another run at it if I may. O on that assumption that... Uh, um, that, that Hall is inconsistent, uh, then one would have to read Hall as determining that although active participation is required for the defence of illegality to succeed, there is no requirement that it be proportionate to raise, be proportionate to apply the illegality defence, because of course we don't see proportionality referred to in terms in Hall or that line of authority. No. But we've agreed, haven't we? I say we've agreed. I think we've agreed that that uh, Hall established only that active participation was necessary, not that it was sufficient. And what was sufficient wasn't really identified. And your reference to Green and Bog's article, as, as I read,
made it quickly there and seemed to provide the, to just a Lieutenant Mercer provided the answer to that. Indeed, my lord. So but rather than saying that there is anything inconsistent between Hall and Lieutenant Mercer, it could be said that Lieutenant Mercer clarified something that was left open by Hall, in which case the Vice President uh, observation in paragraph 62 of Arcadena was, was not wrong. Indeed, my lord. I'm very happy to... Uh, put it that way, as I as I mentioned a few minutes ago, one way of looking at it is to say that Patel and Mirza elucidates yes, well, it, 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 something more. Yeah. So, I, I, to be clear, I don't rest on the I don't need to rest on the proposition uh, that the earlier authorities are inconsistent with Patel and Mirza. It would be one way of reading them, but if one doesn't need to go that far, all well and good. I'm, I'm perfectly happy to to rest on the alternative way of putting the proposition. Uh, I, I, my lord, I don't propose to do any detail with my learned friend's point about singularis and the, and the uh, standard of review, uh, if we are right that the employment tribunal simply failed to engage with the proportionality analysis, that's a plain error of law. It's not a case where we're saying employment tribunal engaged with the proportionality al analysis but we disagree with their conclusion. It simply didn't, it was misdirection, it didn't even ask the right questions. And um, uh, perhaps I can deal with this without turning it up, but in relation to the Grondona, the other Supreme Court case that Maloney Friend took you to, can I just ask you to note, and this comes back um, partly to Maloney Friend, to um, my Lord Lord Justice Singh's question about the audience. Paragraph 26 uh, refers uh, that in a case where one gets to the third stage of the Patel analysis, which Maloney Friend concedes would be the case <coughs> because there are competing policy considerations. Um, uh, uh, Lord Lloyd Jones said, uh, "It is likely the court will have to give close scrutiny to the detail of the case at hand." Uh, and one can see, both in that case and in Singularis, that if one looks at the reasoning below that's set out in the report, so that's exactly what happened. The judge, at first instance, went through each of the um, Telemerza uh, requirements. In this case, am I right? The only reference to Telemerza in the ET's judgment is paragraph 95. Uh, my lord, that, that, that's right. I think a it, passing it, reference. Simply to distinguish between illegality and performance and a contract that's Ill illegal from the outset, that is the only reference to it. And submissions on Patel were made to the Employment Tribunal. I was going to ask that. It, but I it is, it is un odd, for yes. myself, it's odd that they go into some detail about uh, Grashi. Um, and then only this passing reference to Patel. Yes. Can I, can I just assist on that point, if it, if it, would, if it would help? I, I only rise to my feet because I know that my learned friend didn't appear below. Just a, a very short point, if, if, if it would be of assistance, just, just to throw some light on it. Yes. By that stage, Ocadina and Jakali hadn't been decided in the Court of Appeal, but it had been decided in the Employment Appeal Tribunal. And her Honour Judge Edie issued that case, deciding it in the EAT, three similar observations to those re reached by Court of Appeal. So the lie of the land as far as the Employment Appeal Tribunal was concerned was that Patel and Merza hadn't changed anything as far as the Court well, no, no doubt the submissions might, might enlighten us as to why the ET dealt with Patel in the way that it did. Well, my lord, yes, but we say it's a, it's a, it's a clear error. Um, uh, and clearly Patel was cited before the um, Tribunal, there's no doubt about that. My Lord, if I can move on yeah, then. We, we, just before you do, you just, just pause one moment, please, I think. Just give me a bit of time. Yeah, I haven't drank really. What, eat my lady? Okay. Do you want to? Uh, well, should we write something? Yeah, well, I just wrote something. Yeah. Would, would it be a good idea to write Yeah, well, I think so. I think so. Yeah. Um, Mr. Williams, we're, we're, we're sorry to interrupt you, but um, <coughs> one of our number has uh, another matter which just requires a, <coughs> a, a attention briefly and uh, I wouldn't want to leave it any later. So with, with apologies, we'll just rise for a, for a few minutes. <coughs> rise.
the reason is because it didn't include it in the summary. Sorry, uh, but I didn't. I'm Sorry, I'm, my mind is busy with this important thing. Um, in the, the, the law in the, in the IRL, or the, the equivalent of temporary yeah. language. Yeah, yeah. 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 it's like leave and die days. Surprisingly, it's because you didn't include it in the summary, no one actually bothers to read it. Yeah, I mean, Sorry. this is the point. At least on one view, I mean, it's. I know. I, um, I was surprised though that nobody. I mean, I, I mean, I mean, I mean, it's just all the long. I think it's quite interesting. I feel a bit presumed here. Yeah. I don't think because people just think I'm never going to get past my day in court. Yeah. Having done maybe ten in my whole career with a job, um, but we've been running it. We've been when I've been out in court, I've been claiming we've been running it too long. Yeah. Yeah. Waiting for a chance to go to court. But you know that steer and storm shore is going to court. Yeah. yeah. That's a very interesting thing, isn't it? Isn't it? Yeah, I'd love to have been in that. Yeah. Really, really. Are you doing nearly all employment law these days? Uh, yeah, I'm just doing, I'm in a bit of commercial, do a bit of police work as well. I'm not commissioned yet, but it's an, it's an honest but mistaken belief that we're at a sort of the... Uh, best the to do that, thank you, Jane. Because I read that to people who are the police officers, for example. Um, you know, well, you can do face to face work and that's all gone on. You can spend that, especially for people who are young. Well, I mean, it's definitely easier than not being a public police officer, which I am. So, I just think it'd be easier. So, for example, you know, it was a day when the three judges had their lunch tables, so within when was it? Over the case of my first one, I got, I, you know, I couldn't go and join for lunch. Oh, um, I see. But they just wanted me. What was that case that Nick? It was Noel and Miriam Spiro, where he was sitting. Yeah, that's yeah. right. Yeah.
Um, sorry for that interruption. Thank you for your patience. Uh, the last thing I need to deal with in relation to um, this area of my submissions is um, proportionality in this case, which will involve drawing together largely points I've already made, so I'm hoping I can make it fairly expeditiously. We submit that there were significant features indicating uh, that the barring of the claims claims for unfair dismissal and wrongful dismissal on the basis of illegality would indeed be disproportionate. Firstly, and I gave you the factual details yesterday, the respondent had mischaracterised the relationship for self-employed, self-employment throughout the relationship and steadfastly refused to operate the AYE system in relation to the claimant and fellow employees, despite her repeated request to that effect, those of her solicitors and tax advisors, uh, and despite advice received by the respondent from his own specialist advisors, PwC, and despite HMRC considering that the claimant was an employee. Furthermore, had that occurred, the claimant been put on PAY, then these difficulties would never have arisen. Tax would have been deducted of sorts. In this case, you have my submissions yesterday, it's quite distinct from the Enfield type of situation where both parties were under a mutual misunderstanding, as it were, that the relationship was one of self-employment. Indeed, when one, I don't take you to it now, but when one reads the tribunal's analysis as to why the claimant was an employee, it's pretty clear cut uh, in this case that that was indeed her status. Are you saying the difficulties would never have arisen? I mean, presumably they would still have arisen between 2007 and whenever that advice came. My lord, uh, well, well the, the claimant was always an employee. The respondent's reasons for not putting her on PAY have become much harder to justify after 2014 when the point's being repeatedly raised. It's a matter of yes. legality. She should always have been right. treated as an employee. That, that may be right, but uh, I, mean, I don't know whether we're going to have to go into this, but if we are, we haven't had full submissions on whether PAY in fact applied between 2007 and 2011. Yesterday, Mr. Laddie, in passing, made the point that um, because the employer was abroad in 2011, that it may be that PAYE doesn't apply anyway. But, uh, I'm not sure we're going to have to go into that, but if we are, then I'm afraid we probably would need chapter and verse on PAYE. My Lord, I'm, yes, I'm not in a position to give that today. I wasn't aware no, of that point until Mr. Laddie raised it yesterday. Uh, my Lord, um, it might seem that I'm arguing against another of my points, but if uh, we are wrong in relation to ground three and the case is to be remitted, then we don't have to go so far as to persuade this court that ultimately it would be disproportionate to deny the claimant's claim. We simply have to show that there are factors that could have led to that conclusion, uh, and that is a matter uh, to be remitted uh, for the tribunal. I, obviously, my primary submission would be that we would wish to go further and persuade this court that the matter is clear cut and that it would plainly be disproportionate to apply the illegality defence. But if there remain any areas of uncertainty, uh, then that is our fallback position. Yes, sir. <coughs> uh, my Lord. Um, uh, secondly, and I'm, I'm, I'm summarising as it were broad areas that contain the real point, but secondly, uh, uh, on the claimant's case, which the Employment Tribunal, we say, wrongly failed to make findings on, the respondent had behaved either unlawfully or at least reprehensibly in deliberately manipulating matters to portray the claimant and other employees to the outside world as self-employed. Thirdly, as the tribunal floated in paragraph 104, there was potentially significant financial correspondence in not treating the claimant as an employee. Fourthly, the claimant had, on the tribunal's findings, a well-founded claim for unfair dismissal and wrongful dismissal. It's not a case where illegality is being raised at an early stage and no 
determinations have been made, it's known that subject to illegality, the claimant had a well-founded claim in both those causes of action. Next, the claimant performed the contracts entirely lawfully for almost three years, from 1st of July 2014, and I rely on without repeating the points that I've made in relation to that earlier this morning. And this is something I touched on yesterday. In that regard, it is particularly stark to bear in mind that if the illegality uh, defence applies, the claimant uh, would lose any right to enforce the contract in respect of that three-year period where she performed the contract lawfully. She could not sue for wages, for example, that were unpaid uh, during that period. We also rely on refer to, to the point that's been already canvassed in argument that there are uh, criminal penalties, there are other processes for recovering back tax uh, and the focus here uh, is not upon those but is upon the performance of the contract. Then in response to my learned friend's points that he made yesterday suggesting that the, um, the direction of travel is the opposite and that as he would have it, that it clearly would be proportionate to enforce the illegality defence. A significant part of the points that my learned friend relied on in that part of his submissions yesterday did or were grounded in the, the fraud point, which as I've addressed you on, is no part of the tribunal. In the, I'm sorry, at which points? The fraud point. Fraud I'm calling points. it that as a shorthand. Fraud point, yes. Yeah form no part of the <coughs> tribunal's findings of illegality. Secondly, my learned friend's analysis of omits nearly all of the points that I have just identified in the claimant's favour. Thirdly, Vladdy's points rely on findings that were not in fact made below, such as his client's supposed <coughs> benevolence. Then as regards the point about the degree of connection between the claim and the illegality. My learned friend said yesterday, well, they were one and the same. The claimant was dismissed for the illegality. Uh, my Lord, that, in our respectful submission, is simply not correct. And if I can ask you to turn the tribunal decision up in that regard. So it's page, uh, for this point, it's page 239 of the documents bundle, paragraph 91. Sorry, the page number again. 239, my lord. <coughs> Paragraph 91, which is the bottom of that page. My lord, this is the tribunal's finding as to the reason for the dismissal in relation to the unfair dismissal claim, so that's why it's directly germane. Uh, my lord, there are a couple of typos, and they were accepted to be a typos at the hearing before Mr Justice Lewis, so can I tell you how the sentence should read firstly, and then... Um, come back to it. So if you pick up the last four lines on that page, you see a sentence that begins, we have found that she was an employee. And then the next sentence is, he did not agree and would, and it was agreed below that there should be a not there, would not deduct tax. And then the second typo is in the last sentence. You see it says ig, it should say if. So with those two corrections, can I ask you to read uh, those uh, lines, the last four lines? In fact, to, to, to complete it, if you could read the rest of the paragraph over the page.
tribunal says the claimant wasn't dismissed because she wasn't paying tax, that would have been unfair because it was down to the employer to d that she should have been on PAYE. She was dismissed because of the dispute, the deadlock over the was the 37,000 net or gross and therefore who was liable to pay the tax. And that finding also accorded with the uh, finding on, as to the reason for dismissal which was considered by the tribunal in relation to the whistleblowing claim. If I can just give you the references without going back over it, it's paragraph 84 and 87. So whilst there is some factual interrelationship in terms of the underlying circumstances, the reason for the dismissal was not in fact the illegality, uh, but was the um, dispute over whether the salary was net or gross. It's rather more clearly said at paragraph 87, actually, yes, my Lord. compared to the slightly uh, conv convoluted <coughs> way it was yes. at paragraph 9. Uh, my Lord, I apologise, yes, I took it no, 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 because no. we were concerned with the ordinary unfair dismissal case rather yeah, than the whistleblowing case at this stage. It's, it's the same, the same thing, but it's, yes. for my part, I, I can understand it yes. first reading as opposed to yes, I think several readings. Just as Lewis re referred to paragraph, um, paragraph I've just taken to you as being somewhat convoluted or... It, yeah, aspects. he did. My Lord, I'm conscious of time, so unless I can assist you further, I want to move on then to the interim relief uh, appeal, which uh, I will deal with more um, swiftly to, to, to let you know where I'm going in terms of time. I've agreed with my learned friend that my time runs up till 2.30, so assuming the usual outline, I've got an hour and a half to deal with um, that appeal. So I think it might be helpful to, to let you know that at the outset in terms of what I'm aiming to do, uh, uh, and um, um, I hope that's acceptable. So in relation to the interim um, relief appeal, if I may, I'm going to start with the uh, statutory provisions. You will have seen reference in both parties' skeletons, my Lord, to the fact that the interim relief provisions are of long standing. They first appeared in the Employment Protection Act of 1975, which is in the bundle for completeness. It's the first document in the authorities' bundle, but I don't take you to it because the structure is essentially reflected in the later too. At that stage, it was about trade union membership. That's right. Isn't it? Trade union membership and trade union activities, my lord, yes. And those. This is 74 79 government. Yes. And those provisions relating to trade union membership and trade union activities now are to be found in the Trade Union Labour Relations Consolidation Act. Yes. Of. Um, sorry, I've had a brain freeze. I've forgotten the year it is. Thank you. <laughs> 1992. And. Uh, I won't take you to them at this stage, but for your Lordship's reference, they are at page 14 onwards in the bundle. They are, uh, apart from in a few respects which I'll come back to, the same as the Employment Rights Act provisions, which are the ones that operate in this case, and which I will take <coughs> you to now. And so, my Lords, in that regard, if we can go to page 29 of the Authorities Bundle, please. The interim, as we see from subsection one, the interim relief provisions apply in relation to certain types of dismissal only, and those where it is asserted that the reason or principal reason for the dismissal as regards this Act, is a reason listed in Roman numeral 1 or 2. We've listed what those different um, reasons are in paragraph 40 of our skeleton. So unless it's helpful to do so, I won't take you through each of them now. But it's a number of reasons. It's not all the reasons that lead to an automatic unfair dismissal under the Act, but it's a number of the reasons that lead to an automatic unfair dismissal. So to give you a flavour, it includes things such as performing functions as a health and safety representative, uh, acting as a trustee of an occupational uh, pension scheme. 
Uh, and then, of course, the relevant one for present purposes is section 103A, uh, which is a, um, a dismissal where it said the reason or principal reason was making protective disclosures. Uh, and then in um, limb B of subsection 1, there's a reference to section 104F1. Uh, that's dismissal in relation to blacklisting. There's also a very helpful list, in fact, a more comprehensive one than the one in paragraph 40 of our skeleton in Mr. Justice Kavanaugh's in the Steer case, which I'll come on to. So that's a good source if one wants a comprehensive list of the jurisdictions to which interim relief applies. There's not much case law on all of this, is that right? There are a number of Employment Appeal Tribunal cases. There are not as far as uh, we are aware, and I could have learned a friend in this as well, any case that's previously come to the Court of Appeal. However, and of course I appreciate that Employment Appeal Tribunal cases are not binding upon this board, but however, uh, there does appear to be a fairly clear way in which the provisions have been understood and operated consistently, we would say, by the Employment Appeal Tribunal over many years. And the issue between us really is whether this case presents an exception to those uh, principles and provisions. I don't think there's any dispute between us as to how those provisions have been operated, and neither of us suggests that any of those decisions are wrong. So I address you on the basis that although they're not binding decisions upon this court... In fact, you say they're right. Yes, yes we positively say they're right, but my learned friend doesn't say they're wrong. He says that this case is an exception to them. So uh, I'll approach matters on that on that basis, uh, my lords. Um, so uh, then you see at subsection 2 the provision uh, that the application must be made within seven days of the termination of the contract, that it must be determined by the tribunal as soon as practicable, that's subsection 3, provision in subsection 4 for giving the employer notice, and in subsection 5, that the hearing shall not be postponed, save where the tribunal is satisfied there's special circumstances. <coughs> then in section 129, subsection 1, we have the test which is to be applied. Uh, uh, to grant relief, namely that if the tribunal considers it's likely that on determining the complaint in which the application relates, the tribunal will find that the reason, or if more than one, the principal reason for the dismissal is one of those specified in, and then it's the jurisdictions that are listed in section 128 that we just looked at. And we will see shortly in the case law how that test, uh, the likely put test, has been interpreted. Uh, subsection 2 is that the tribunal shall, shall announce its findings and explain its powers. Subsection 3, the tribunal shall ask the employer if present if he's willing to reinstate or re-engage the employee. And then you'll see subsection 5, what happens if he is willing to reinstate at 6, what happens <laughs> if re-engagement is accepted. Uh, but if that's not the case, uh, you'll see at uh, subsection 9, if on the hearing of an application for interim relief, the employer either fails to attend or states he's unwilling to reinstate or re-engage, then the tribunal shall make an order for the continuation of the employer's contract of employment. That's called a contract continuation order, and the specifics are dealt with in the next section, section 130. You'll see subsection 1, an order under section 129 for the continuation of the contract, order the contract of employment, continues in force A for the purposes of pay and other benefits and B for the purpose of continuity of employment uh, from the date of determination to the date of um, uh, determination or settlement of the complaint. Two, when the order is made, the tribunal shall specify the amount which is to be paid by way of pay <coughs> in respect of each normal pay period, so whether that be monthly or, or weekly as the case may be. So it can specify a a sum less than the contractual sum? Uh, well, uh, uh, my lord, if you then look at subparagraph 3, subsection 3, the amount so specified should be that which the employer could reasonably be expected to have okay, earned so during the period. Not. So, uh, yes. Okay. Uh, and then at 5, uh, summarising, but in effect it says that if other payments have been made uh, by the employer for damages for breach of contract, they could be taken into account in discharging this liability and vice versa. Then uh, section 131, which we say is of some relevance in understanding Parliament's intentions to how these provisions were 
operate. Subsection 1 provides that if any time between the making of the order and the determination of the complaint, the parties may apply to the tribunal for revocation or vari variation of the order on ground of a relevant change of circumstances since making the order. We say it's significant that there's no express provision for the equivalent application to be made after the determination of the complaint. And then in section 132, that deals with the consequence of failure on the part of the employer to comply with the order. Uh, and for present purposes, if I can just take you to subsections 4 and 5. Uh, 4 says that if the tribunal is satisfied on application, that's the case, 5 or 6 apply. And 5 says, where non-compliance consists of a failure to pay an amount by way of pay specified in the order, the tribunal should determine the amount owed by the employer on the date of determination. And B, if it's the same date when the tribunal also determines the complaint that he has been unfairly dismissed, it shall specify that amount separately from any other sum awarded to the employee. And we draw attention to that because it, it, it is a reference to the ultimate determination of the case, but without any suggestion that that should impact on the um, grant or revocation of the contract continuation order. My Lord, those are the Employment Rights Act provisions to take you to. In relation to the trade union provisions, there are just three points to highlight, if I may, which I can do if, I, if we now go to page 14. <coughs> so just, just pausing there before, before we move on, the <coughs> continuation order shall be made if the criteria are met. There doesn't appear to be any provision for any appeal if there's a dispute about whether the criteria are met or not. Well, there's certainly no discretion um, in terms if the criteria are met, it must be applied, and there mm. can be an appeal in, in the way that the normal provisions for appealing a employment tribunal judgment to the EAT apply, as we'll see in the cases that. Right. <coughs> the, the, the normal provisions apply. Yes. All right. <laughs> And is there any express provision about what happens to this sum in the event of the claim succeeding or failing? No, there is nothing. So it's expressed. silent about that. So it's the, 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 as I understand it, the principle is having rec recovered such compensation or pay as uh, under the order, uh, these, one of these orders, a someone in your client's position is entitled to keep it, whatever the outcome of the unfair. My lord, that's what the EAT cases have consistently said. So we'll see. So it's quite a, um, perhaps blunt instrument is rather a crude way of putting it, but obviously I'm comparing it with, in my mind, with other things, such as, for example, interim maintenance in, in, in divorce cases, where there's much more flexibility. Yeah. This, this whole regime doesn't provide for that degree of flexibility at all. My is Lord, that right? that's right. Provision could have been made, for example, for the money to be paid into court or either the statute or case law could have developed a process whereby a claimant has to give cross undertakings that they'll repay the money in the event of the claim failing. None of that. The What's the accepted justification for having th this fairly inflexible approach? Uh, as I understand it, um, uh, my Lord, it is because the reason that these provisions were uh, introduced is because they relate to dismissals where there are likely to be particular sensitivities uh, and therefore it is felt appropriate that there is a particular level of protection uh, for the employee at the same time as we will also see in the authorities because there are these uh, uh, potentially far-reaching and irreversible consequences the courts have interpreted the likely test as not a balance of probabilities test but as requiring a higher threshold for the claimant to meet so the courts have effectively priced into the test the threshold test that they have set the Pretty good chance. that an employer could be prejudiced if the claim ultimately fails. Right. Thank you. So, my Lord, just very briefly, um, in relation to the trade union provisions, uh, section 152, which you'll see on page 15, I'm not going to go through the details, but section 152, subsection 1, gives you the list of the kind of 
gives you the list of the reasons that would make a dismissal automatically unfair in the union context in which the interim relief provisions apply. My Lord, then there's two points to notice about the interim relief provisions here, which are otherwise in all respects the same as the ERA, ERA provisions we've just looked at. Firstly, if you look at 161 on page 16, subsection 3, the claimant who applies for interim relief must provide a certificate from an authorised official of the union certifying not only that the person in question was a member of the union, but, reading B, there appear to be reasonable grounds for supposing that the reason for his dismissal was the one alleged in the complaint. So that's a rather unusual provision as well, that whilst that's not determinative, the Employment Tribunal still considers the evidence, but there is a mandatory requirement that the union in question, under these provisions, provides a certification that they believe uh, that uh, uh, there is reasonable grounds for the contention of dismissal on the prohibited grounds. Uh, and then, my Lord, the third reason why I take you to these provisions uh, is um, section 167, page 20, subsection 2, which provides that these sections, sections in the Trade Union and Labour Relations Consolidation Act, are to be construed as one with part 10 of the Employment Rights Act, so the provisions in play. So that's why it's particularly important to have in mind the trade union provisions and how they operate as well. My Lord, I'm then going to leap ahead in time to Mr Justice Kavanagh's judgment in the Steer case because it does um, respectfully contain a very helpful summary of how the provisions operate. This case is to be found at uh, page 499 in the bundle. And the actual issue in the case, which isn't one that concerns us but is of underlying interest, was whether the interim relief provisions should apply to a discrimination claim as well, in light of various EU provisions and convention provisions that were relied on. And that question is now under appeal to this court. So potentially, the interim relief provisions could extend to discrimination claims as well, depending on how this court des decides steer. Sorry, where, where is steer? Uh, 499 onwards. Thank you. Uh, and did you say steer is on appeal to this court? Yes. On one point, or the, the principal point? Yes, that principal point. Uh, I mean, and I to summarise the point again, whether... Whether the interim relief provisions apply to discrimination claims. They don't on their face, but there were arguments, as you'll see from the head note, the helpful head note on the first page of the report, there were arguments based both on European law uh, and... <coughs> on the Convention, the European <coughs> Convention of Human Rights, that Article 14. the statutory provisions should be interpreted uh, in that uh, manner. So for present purposes, my Lords, the helpful summary or history or overview that I referred to is to be found at paragraph 27 onwards, and it extends throughout the following paragraphs that have been sidebarred. But can I just, for present purposes, draw your attention to a few particular features. Firstly at paragraph 28, this is page 505, uh, Mr Justice Kavanagh makes the point that under Rule 95 of the Tribunal Rules of Procedure, the norm is that the Tribunal does not hear oral evidence at an interim relief hearing unless the Employment Tribunal directs otherwise. Is relevant because it underscores the summary, impressionistic nature of the hearing. Uh, my Lords, then turning to paragraph 31, and if I can pick it up halfway through paragraph 31, there's a sentence that begins, this is a valuable benefit. That's to say, an interim relief order in the claimant's favour. This is a valuable benefit because it can take a number of months before a claim is finally determined, or even longer in a complex means that the claimant has a financial cushion while she or he is waiting for his or her claim to be heard. 
it is particularly valuable because the employee will not have to repay the money received even if his or her claim ultimately fails. So we're going to look at some other authorities on that point um, shortly. Uh, in paragraph 32, there is a reference to the history and the, re the rationale for the provisions originally being introduced, which may be also of interest in light of um, Lord Lord Justice Baker's question. Um, so I um, uh, draw your attention to, to that. And then at paragraph 34, which I foreshadowed earlier, is the full list of the jurisdictions to which the interim relief provisions currently apply. And then the statutory provisions are set out. And in paragraph uh, 39, page 507, there is a reference to the current president of the Employment Appeal Tribunal, Mr Justice Cowdery's decision in Simply Smile, to the effect that the likely to succeed test applies to all elements that are in issue. So, for example, if the employer, if the respondent disputes that the claimant was an employee, the likely to succeed test applies there, or for example, if the respondent were to dispute that there was a dismissal. My Lords, I'm then slightly running ahead of myself in terms of topics, but while we've got this case open, can I ask you to read 54 and through to 56 on page 509 because there the point about the ultimate outcome of the merits hearing not affecting the interim relief order is further referred to and developed. A number of the, th the authorities refer to the fact, and we'll see this as we're moving through them, but if I can highlight the, the point at this stage, that the assessment is an impressionistic and a summary one. We've already seen that all evidence isn't normally heard. Furthermore, given the timescale within which the hearing normally takes place, disclosure is unlikely to have taken place, or at least full disclosure to have taken place by that juncture. Uh, and if I can give you the references to one example uh, of this without turning it up at this stage, because we'll come to it from a different point of due course, but is um, Her Honour Judge Edie, she then was judgment in the earlier uh, round of appeal to the Employment Appeal Tribunal case, uh, Employment Appeal Tribunal in this case, uh, where she refers to the summary nature of the assessment 
and it's paragraphs 17 and 18 about authorities in the documents bundle as it relates to this case. So it's page 265 in the documents bundle and also paragraph 59 at page 280. And she refers to some of the other authorities there as well in that clause. My Lords, then next coming on to the um, likelihood test and the way that that's been interpreted uh, by the uh, courts, as, as I mentioned, it factors in the potential prejudice to the employer uh, should he or she be ordered to pay money and then the claim ultimately fails. And we see that, first of all, in the Taplin case, which is to be found at page 66. So that was decided um, back in uh, 1978. That has held good as the test thereafter. A decision of Mr Justice Slynn The uh, uh, appeal revolved around the likely to succeed test and what it meant, as you will see from the facts in the head note, the chairman of the tribunal had expressed a particular view um, that it connoted a degree near certainty um, rather than probability. And so what the test entailed was discussed by Mr Justice Slynn at paragraphs 19 through to 23, 68 to 69, can I ask you to read uh, that please, the most important are 20, 21 and 23. So the test is one of a pretty good chance of success, higher than a balance of probabilities test. That has stood the time since 1978 as the test, as the test of, and explicitly... Um, forgive, forgive me for interrupting. I, I may have misread this passage. <laughs> uh, I certainly see that it's higher than a reasonable prospect of success, because that, that's explicitly rejected. But they, they appeared to be drawing a contrast between that and a 51% probability but you're saying that they're actually saying pretty good chance means higher than the balance of probability. Yes, my lord. Um, for, the, for the reasons that the um, that Mr Justice Lynn identified, namely the potential prejudice to the employer. No, I understand okay. the uh, the underlying rationale, but... Uh, it, it's spe If I could short circuit it in that way, when we come on to Mr Justice Chowdhury's judgment yes, in the Turbo, he says that in terms. Right. Well, well, I have to say, speaking for myself only, I don't regard the phrase pretty good chance as immediately suggesting that uh, even that it's more likely than not, let alone something higher than that. But no, no, that's the way it's been understood. All right. <laughs> well, the, the statutory word is likely, isn't it? Yes. And that's the word which is used in a number of other statutes. Yes. It doesn't mean, I've never come across it meaning pretty good chance. Uh, as we'll see in, in, in the next case we come to. I'll, should, a... I'll try to suggest in that in, when we look at Section 31 of the Children Act next week. See, what, see the look on Council's face. 
Anyway, it's been accepted. That's the universe. Uh, yes. in, uh, in the employment area. That is what is understood. And we'll see in the, the next case an, an attempt to equate uh, likelihood um, in this statute with um, the meaning of likelihood in the disability discrimination provisions, and that was unsuccessful. Uh, and again, the same policy reason identified. And in fact, for present purposes, for our purposes, in a sense, it, it, it doesn't necessarily even matter where the bar is set. The important point for our purposes is the reasoning underpinning the setting of the threshold in all these cases is because priced into that setting of the threshold is the fact that monies paid by an employer will be irrecoverable if the claim ultimately fails. That's the important point of view from our perspective. And, and, and what is the origin of that? Is this a case law decision or is there a statutory provision, the irrecoverability? There are a number of cases, and I'll, I'll take you to the what, what we believe is the first case on that, if I mm. may, in a few moments, my lord, once I've dealt with the cases right. on, the, on, on, on the test. Uh, we also respectfully submit it's, it's entirely consistent with the statutory provisions, which, as you saw, for example, in Section 131, provided for uh, revocation or variation if there was a change of circumstances up to termination of the substantive complaint but but not if the change of circumstances is you've lost exactly and the, the <laughs> plainly could easily have said that were that the parliamentary intention okay so if, if if i may i'll just follow through the thread of cases about the test before then coming on to to, to that although to some extent there's duplication of course because so if i go to the decision of mr um justice underhill is he then was that i've just um, mentioned uh, that is the Dandpert case, and that is page 179 in the bundle. And to understand the issue that was raised, the quickest way of doing that is to look at the summary on page 181, that there was an argument that because of a, a interpretation of the meaning of likely, by the Supreme Court in the SA Packaging and Limited and Boyle case, which related to the definition of disability under the disability discrimination provisions, this test should be revisited, a proposition which Mr Justice Underhill rejected. And we can see that at um, paragraph 20. Um, before that, if I can just draw your attention in passing to paragraph 17 on page 188, that's another reference to the nature of the assessment being a summary one. And then if we move swiftly on to paragraph 20, you'll see it begins by saying meaning of likely, as we've already indicated, that's a cross-reference to paragraph 14, the tribunal in applying the section of the one test took its guidance on the meaning of likely from the decision in Taplin. And then there's the contention based on Boyle. Um, to um, reconsider that point, and you'll see it's rejected by Mr Justice Underhill over the page, the sidebar, indeed underlined text at the end of paragraph 20. Taplin has been recognised as good law for 30 years. We see nothing um, to, in the experience of the intervening period, suggest it should be reconsidered. On ordinary principles, guided by unless it's plainly wrong, far, very far from the case, we in fact see good reasons of policy for setting the test comparatively high in the way in which the tribunal did in the case of applications for interim relief. If relief was granted, the respondent is irretrievably prejudiced. And so, forth. Uh, and so again, uh, my lord, that um, uh, makes good uh, our uh, submission. Uh, if I may, before I, I've referred in answering my lord, Lord Justice Singh's question to a recent judgment of Mr Justice Chowdhury, but before I come to that so I can draw the strands together, I will take you to the first case about the um, irrevocable nature of payments made, and that's the initial textile case, uh, my lords, and that is to be found at page 96. I can summarise the first few paragraphs which deal with the factual uh, position. Uh, it was an appeal by the respondent employer who um, an interim relief order had been made below 
but because there had been a delay in the listing of that interim relief hearing, it was already quite a substantial sum of money. And one of the employer's complaints, amongst others, was that it was now expected to pay this quite substantial sum of money in a short period of time. The Employment Appeal Tribunal was presided over by the then President, Mr Justice Wood, and a number of related points are, are, are relevant. Firstly, my Lord, you will note from the end of the first paragraph on page 97 that it is conceded by both sides before us that the money is irrecoverable. The matters didn't stop there. If you then look at the last paragraph on the same page, perhaps I could ask you to, 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 to read that paragraph uh, and then in fact uh, the next the first three paragraphs on page 98 Everyone agreed it was irrecoverable, but um, speaking for myself, I'm no closer to understanding why that's so. Well, my Lord, because there's no provision in the statute to, to, that provides for recovery of it, and all the indications in the statute are to the contrary, for example, mm. then equivalent of section 131. Okay. But logically, wouldn't, again, coming from entirely from the outside, it would, once the first thought would be, it would make more sense to have a, a, a system whereby the a scheme whereby the award of interim relief was uh, available to, for a lower threshold than pretty good chance, but for it to be recoverable mm -hmm. at the discretion of the, of, of the court or the tribunal at the end of the proceedings. Well, my lord, obviously that would be one way of, of having the scheme, but the, the one of the significance of Mr Justice Wood's decision here, third paragraph on page 98, is he specifically, not only does he agree with the concession made by council that it was irrecoverable, but he in turn suggests that it is something that Parliament might like to take another look at. But the legislature has not at any stage <coughs> taken up that opportunity. It would, be, would have been easy for provision to have been made for uh, a system of recoverability of the kind that your lordship refers to, if that was the statutory intention, uh, but that has not been done. Uh, and since the uh, the scheme, the scheme, my proposed <laughs> approach, which I agree, okay, we won't take much time on this, but it would it would mean that more people, more claimants, could get the benefit of relief at the stage where they need it. Well, my lord, I, I understand the attraction of that, but the the, the reality is. This is the way the provisions have been interpreted from the 1970s up till now by successive presidents of the Employment Appeal yes. Tribunal. When I said there wasn't much case law earlier, I, was, I, was clearly, I ought not to have been so dismissive. There's considerable case law from a very distinguished number of, <laughs> of judges, many of whom moved on to even greater distinction yeah, after. Quite so. <laughs> and I think there's the one significant point you draw attention to is that Parliament has chosen not to amend the legislation ever since Quite so on the basis of this understanding of the law. So, exactly so. And, but there have been various statutory iterations since then, since the 1975 Act, then there was the 1978 Act. Right. Uh, and so forth. Yeah. Has it ever been, you've taken us to where it was agreed, has there ever been an argument before uh, a court which has had to be resolved by a judge as to whether or not it's recoverable? Uh, my Lord, I'm not aware, I'm aware of a number of, we would say, authoritative statements that it's not recoverable, for example, Mr Justice Kavanagh that I took you to um, earlier, I'm going to take you to another example in a, in a, in a moment, uh, but I don't understand the contrary to have been suggested, we would say it's because it's so clear from the provisions that um, it isn't. And it is where, as Mr Justice Wood says in the last paragraph on uh, page 97, these are stringent provisions, but that's where Parliament's set the balance. It's clear because Parliament, the Act is silent about yes. it. Any, any recovery? 
if, there, if, if an employer is to claim it has some right to undo the order that's been made, one would need to have some statutory provision. And I think you also said a moment ago that there is this fundamental underlying policy behind the legislation. We, we have to remember it originated with yeah. industrial disputes in the 1970s, and that although generally speaking the view was taken that the law should not interfere with collective labour law as opposed to individual employment rights, this was an example where it was thought the public interest would be served by allowing someone to get a swift remedy and say, I haven't in fact been sacked because you victimised me because I was organising a strike or something of that sort. But if you didn't do that, if you didn't have a quick remedy, or if you said afterwards, and, and by the way, your um, organiser will have to repay the money if it turns out that the order should never have been made, even though it's all got to be done very quickly and summarily. Well, that might prove a very powerful incentive to people to say, well, this isn't a very good remedy, we'll go on strike. My Lord, quite so. And also, given the jurisdictions that have now, um, the wider jurisdictions that it applies to, as we've seen, and it's reflected in yeah. that analysis from <coughs> Mr Justice Kavanagh that I took you to, effectively, these sums are intended to provide the subsistence, the wages yes. for the person yes, who's just been sacked. If they face an order further down the line, if their claim loses, that they're going to have to repay the money that was not some additional lump sum, but was effectively intended to, to substitute their wages for each of those intervening periods. It's, um, well, it would be a very strong disincentive from applying for an order in the first place. And another point, in underlining your point about Parliament has not chosen to um, change this, having had, it has expanded the scope of interim relief exactly. on a number of occasions since Tappan. Is that right? Have I got the chronology right? Exactly right. So since it's been understood, uh, in the way that it's been understood, and, and other cases which have elucidated, you would say that it's not recoverable. Yeah. So the case law has established that, and Parliament <coughs> has chosen not to amend, not to clarify it or change the, that, uh, that, that provision in the light of that case law. Exactly so, my Lord. At the time of Taplin, as we see from the first, uh, I'm sorry, I'm looking at initial, I think you, your Lordship meant initial textile, at the time of initial textile, textile. it was the 1978 Act mm -hmm. provisions that applied, which yes. were also in the bundle. Yes. Which are much narrower than the current provision. So, I mean, yes, the, the piecemeal ex ad hoc expansion of interim relief to other areas has taken place since uh, that, that the um, Mr. Justice Wood's case. Uh, my Lord, um, I will take you to Mr. Justice uh, Chowdhury's decision. Before that, can I just give you one other reference without saying it? It's just another recent decision of the EAT, which again. Um, refers to the consequences of the interim order, interim relief order granted being permanent. And that's paragraph 35 uh, in the uh, judgment of His Honour Judge Taylor in Queensgate Investments and Millet, which is page 449 in the bundle. That's so which paragraph? Paragraph 35, and that's to be found at 466. Thank you. 449 is the start of it, 466 is the um, particular passage but I can then go to the Simply Smile Manor House and Tuberg case, which is also sometimes referred to as Hancock and Tuberg. Indeed, I think it might be referred to as Hancock and Tuberg in our skeleton. It's the same case. This was the decision of Mr Justice Chowdhury, page 384 in the bundle, my lords, on the question of whether <coughs> if the status of the claimant as an employee was an issue, did the likely to succeed test apply to that element as well? Or uh, should it simply be assumed in the claimant's favour? On the other hand, did it have, have to positively be proved? There are a number of <coughs> permutations covered in argument. It's not particularly relevant for present purposes to go through all those permutations. Um, Mr Justice Chowdhury's consideration of those various permutations starts at paragraph 41 on page 394. Um, but for present purposes, the um, particularly relevant paragraph is 45. If I can invite you to read that.
schools will see within that paragraph reference to the um, more than 51% test, mm. picking up on the point the Lord Lord Justice Singh raised earlier. And also, secondly, again, um, the clear statement towards the end of that paragraph uh, that if the criteria for making the interim relief order is made out, then the claimant is not liable to subsequently repay any interim payments that were made. And then lastly, paragraph 46 is another restatement of the summary nature of the assessment. I will drawing some points together from um, the cases um, before I come on to the particular circumstances of this case. We submit that all this shows that the fact that money has been paid by an employer under an interim relief order in respect of a claim which subsequently fails at the merits hearing is not regarded in the authorities as an injustice in the sense of a reason in itself to undo uh, the consequences of that interim relief order. There's simply a consequence inherent in the statutory scheme. Equally, it is unhelpful, what my friend does in this case, to, re to describe uh, payments made under an interim relief order as a windfall for the claimants if the claim ultimately fails, because again, it is simply something that is inherent in the nature of the scheme as it has been interpreted by the Employment Appeal Tribunal since the 1970s. And you already have our points about the, the high threshold test. I mean, of course, one takes injustice in the very broad sense. It could operate the other way as well. The claimant could have shown at an interim relief hearing a greater than 51% chance of establishing the success of their claim but they, they don't get the order because that's not enough to meet the pretty good chance of success case. Yes, they'll still get compensation if they win ultimately but they won't get the other benefits of the order for example the fact that their continuity of employment will be treated as running from the um, end of the period of the order rather than the date of the dismissal. Again, these are all factors simply inherent uh, in uh, the uh, scheme uh, it, uh, itself. Equally, uh, and the last point I want to make on, on this topic, it, it doesn't follow that if the an interim relief order is made and the claim ultimately fails, that the interim relief decision was wrong or incorrect. Incorrect, I think, was the terminology used below. Because it's simply a different assessment. It's made on different material, it's a different test, it has a different purpose. So it is in our submission simply inappropriate to talk about an interim relief decision being wrong because the claim ultimately fails. But it's linked to the claim, isn't it? Well, yes, in the sense that it's the, it's the existence of the claim that, that gives rise it's to the Pending right to the determination claim. of the claim. Yes. Mm. It, it is meant to be interim at the risk of stating the obvious. Um, if you know what the final outcome is, yeah. In the real world, how can it be said any longer to be interim? Well, well that was the distinction which Mr Justice Lewis um, drew and, that, and which my learned friend uh, relies on. It is said that that is the distinction because mm. the outcome is now known. Yes. Our, our response to that, my Lord, is that in all the consideration of this topic uh, in the cases, comes from a starting point that the outcome is known. The question is posed, what will happen if the claim ultimately fails? Ah, the money is irrecoverable. Well, no, 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 so, so, sorry. Uh, as you've uh, helpfully shown us, the scheme is intended to work swiftly. That's why you have those quite short time yes. limits, seven days I mentioned, so on and so forth. It also says the tribunal should make its determination as soon as reasonably practicable. Query whether that is actually any kind of legal duty, but there it is, that's what Parliament ordained. <coughs> um, and one can see the good sense of that. So to, to take my trade union member example, or official example, which is where this all stems from, they didn't want to know in seven months' time whether our strike organiser 
should remain in post. They wanted that person to be very swiftly uh, in post, because otherwise there's a danger that uh, employers will victimise those who arrange strikes, for example. Um, if, if on very unusual, perhaps unique facts, it turns out that the remedy is not being granted quickly, then, and, and you know the final outcome, but what, why should you send it back? It's just, it's just completely unrealistic. Well, my lord, we would respectfully um, submit not. In terms of the expeditiousness envisaged by the statutory provisions, the claimant made her application in time. She did everything that was expected of her under the statutory test, as you will be aware from the procedural history. She satisfied, uh, 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 and unappealably so, every element of the statutory test, apart from this outstanding issue of illegality, where Employment Judge Stewart's decision was set aside, we respectfully submit that she is entitled, having done all that she needed to do to comply with the provisions, to a lawful determination of her interim relief application. It's not her fault that Employment Judge Stewart erred in law when he came to decide illegality, the relevant no, authorities no, no, were put no, before him. It's not her fault that he took eight months to do so. Yeah. Uh, and therefore, why should she be deprived of the remedy that otherwise would um, be, uh, come, we say, coming her way? Uh, as a result, quite frankly, I don't mince my words on it, as a result of his errors and dilatoriness. That, that I understand. Can I just ask you this? Uh, Mr Justice Lewis, as I read his judgment on this topic, concluded that Employment Judge Stewart had fallen into error, uh, and therefore the ET decisions on this topic had to be set aside. Yes. And then the question arose whether he should remit it yes. to the ET. Uh, now at that stage, did he, Mr Justice Lewis, enjoy a discretion about whether to remit it or not? Uh, my Lord, it's not a discretion, it's the same uh, test as I referred to in the illegality appeal, the Jaffrey uh, uh, case. He is obliged to remit mm. unless it can only be decided one way, and indeed that was his reasoning, what he Precise. says in relation to it comes into focus in relation to our ground two. He said, if this was remitted at this stage, the employment judge could only decide it in favour of the employer, in favour of the respondent. Uh, and we say that is flawed for the reasons we've set out in ground two, which I will come on to develop, um, I apprehend, uh, after the lunch in adjournment. Brilliant timing. <laughs> <laughs> Thank you very much. Um, we'll resume then at uh, two o'clock, please. All right.